d1 and d2. So we looked at this experiment and we also looked at another experiment in which we had a pair of beam spinners arranged in the form of an interferometer. So light came in along a single path to either be transmitted or reflected. Then the light is reflected perfectly from these mirrors. And in this particular case, we observe that either of these detectors is going to take So we looked at both of these experiments actually in the previous lecture. In this case, if this is a perfect 50-50 beam pair, either this detector clicks with a 50% probability or this detector clicks with a 50% probability. So this beam spinner is like a random coin toss. You toss a coin and there's a half probability that heads will turn up and a 50% probability that tails is going to turn up. So this is a totally random device in that sense. However, when we concatenate both of these devices together, the result should be random. You should get a 50% probability that this detector is clicking and a 50% probability that this detector is clicking. However, that doesn't happen. Either one of these detectors clicks only. And this is something counterintuitive and it can be explained by the fact that in this region, in between the two beam spinners, that is within the apparatus, within the interferometer, you have a quantum state that is actually a superposition of this path and this path. So your quantum state is ket0 plus ket1 over under root 2. So this is your quantum state inside this region as a whole. And you're not observing it. You're letting the single photon that's coming into the apparatus take its course. It's interfering. It's in a superposition state. You might think that it's taking both parts simultaneously, but you're not observing the parts. You're not obtaining any information about which part the photon is taking. And you let these two possibilities interfere on the second beam spinner. And when they interfere, a so-called interference pattern emerges. And the interference here is that one of these parts has the two possibilities destructively interfering and the other one has the two possibilities constructively interfering. So only one of the detector clicks. So this is something strange. You have a random device which is giving you a random output. But then when you string two random devices together, your output no longer remains random. It remains definite in the sense that only one of these detectors is going to click. So this is something that we observe and this could be explained by the fact that inside this region the quantum state is actually a superposition. Now these states are labels, alright? Let me use the word label here. This path has been labeled 0 and this path has been labeled 1. Now, label means why have I labeled them 0 and 1? Because generally when we talk about information in a computer, in a classical computer, we have zeros and 1s. We have on state and an off state. Please try to be within time. And we spend 15, 20 minutes just letting students in. That's almost one fifth of the class time. So we have these labels. And these labels correspond to a piece of information. Now that information is encoded, in this particular case, in the path of the photon. Right? The path of the photon is encoding the information. Path of the photon encodes information. And the part of the photon is acting like a two-level quantum system. So we say that the part of the photon is our Q bit. All right? Now the question is,
If I would like to find out the problem, let's look at this example. If I would like to find out the probability, capital P, I'm not talking about probability density now, I'm talking about probability. Okay, so I'm putting a capital P for it. Probability densities come with a small p. So if I look at the wave function, without the ket sign, we've looked at wave functions, this can be a function of position and time. Now here position is a continuous variable. Time is a continuous variable. So previously we've been looking at continuous variable quantum mechanics. This is not continuous variable. There are only two possibilities, 0 and 1. 0 and 1. So this is not a continuous variable system. It's a discrete system or a quantized system. Previously, we've been looking at continuous variable systems. And if I take the modulus squared of this, I get the probability density, small p. So this is for continuous level system. Now we're talking about quantized systems. Only two possibilities exist. Now in this case, let's look at this experiment. I would like to find out the probability that detector D1 clicks. So now if I input a state, ket 0, I know that at this, at the output, of the beam splitter, I have created a superposition. This is what the beam splitter does. And this is information that we provided to you, that is a photon comes in, the task of a beam splitter is to create a superposition. That is, it creates the photon which has both of these possibilities ingrained into it. Now when you make a measurement, suppose if you don't make a measurement, you don't have the detectors, this is the quantum state. But as normal human beings, you would like to make a measurement because you would like to gain, extract information. You cannot extract information unless you make a measurement. Right? So if I transmit information from point A to point B, and at point B, the observer has no capability to measure that information, it's useless. So if you would like to build a quantum computer, you not only like to transmit and manipulate information, you should be able to measure it. That's a requirement for quantum computing. So you would put detectors here. Now when you put detectors here, the problem is that this quantum state collapses. You don't find a superposition. You only collapse this quantum state into state zero or state one. Which means that either this detector fires or this detector fires. Fires means clicks. It's a mutual exclusive situation. You can't have both detectors clicking at the same time because the photon is indivisible. All right, so detector D1 clicks with a certain probability. Now, how do we find that probability? That probability actually comes from the quantum state, psi itself. Now, if this is my state, I can write this state as 1 over under root 2 ket 0 plus 1 over under root 2 ket 1. Now the meaning of this 1 over under root 2 is going to get clearer. Why do I have this 1 over under root 2? Now in order to find the probability that this detector clicks, suppose I call this path ket 0. And if this detector clicks, I write down my answer 0 on a piece of paper. And if this detector clicks, which corresponds to the orthogonal path ket1, I write down 1 on my piece of paper. Okay? So now, I have not put in a ket here, because this is classical information. This is a bit. I have converted this qubit into a bit, into a classical piece of information 0 or 1. So what is the probability that detector D1 clicks? In other words, what is the probability that I observe 1 as an outcome? Okay, that's the question. So, I need to find out this particular probability. Now, how do we find out that probability? We look at the state. This is my quantum state. Now, the probability that ket 0 is going to show up 
or I will write down the number one, the measurement outcome one. Okay, let me not confuse you with the measurement outcome. I just call this A and I call this B, I call this alpha, I call this beta or something. So this is one possibility, this is the other possibility. The probability that my detected clicks is given by the amplitude or the coefficient that appears with ket0, which is 1 over under root 2, and then I take the modulus squared of this. Okay, so I take this coefficient, I take the modulus and square it. What's the answer? One half. <coughs> so the probability that detector D1 clicks is one half. The probability that detector D2 clicks is 1 over under root 2, the coefficient of this state, modulus squared, 1 over half. So by looking at these coefficients of these two states, ket0 and ket1, I can tell what the probability of a particular outcome is going to be. Therefore, these coefficients within the states are called probability amplitudes. And this is the square of, modulus square of a probability amplitude, which is a probability. Suppose I have a special kind of beam splitter, not the normal 50-50 beam splitter, but a special kind of beam splitter which actually creates a state given by 1 over under root 3 ket 0 plus 2 over under root 3 ket 1. I can have a beam splitter like this, I can engineer a beam splitter which creates this kind of superposition. Now what's the probability that D1 clicks? 1 over 3. And what's the probability that D2 clicks? 2 over 3. And you look at the probability amplitude squared, 1 over 3 plus 2 over 3 must equal 1. That's the normalization condition for this discrete system, for this qubit. Remember, we're talking about a qubit here because we have two possibilities. 0 and 1. Suppose I put an iota here. I can have a beam filter that produces this superposition. If I put uh, an iota here, first of all, it's a legitimate wave function. It's the quantum state is still correct. It's still a valid quantum state. What's the probability that D1 clicks? 1 over 3. And what's the probability that D2 clicks? Minus 2 over 3. Minus 2 over 3. First of all, probabilities cannot be negative. So if I find out the probability that D2 clicks, it's the modulus square of this thing. Now the modulus square of this thing is this number multiply with its complex conjugate. Now, its complex conjugate is minus iota 2 over under root 3. The number itself is iota 2 over under root 3. This gives me plus 2 over 3. And the probability is real and it's non-zero and positive and less than 1 as we expect it to be. Alright? So, so I can have a qubit which is in a general state. The general state that I can write for a qubit is what's the most general state for a qubit with, the, with this basic understanding? Can I come up with a general state for a qubit? So I can write a complex number, let's call it alpha. 0, 
plus some other complex number at 1. Okay? So this is a general quantum state of a qubit. Okay? You had a question, my friend. Why did they change? I'm just giving you. Suppose I have a beam splitter that creates, which is engineered such that it creates this superposition. Okay? So superpositions can change. There is nothing that is preventing you from having a quantum state of this kind. Okay? Yes. It's not the default position. It depends upon, you see. This language that I'm writing here, please be, be creative. This language that I'm writing here is independent of the physical implementation. Now the path of the photon is a physical implementation. And this language here is a generic language. Right? So when you do computer science, you write a flow chart of an algorithm or an algorithm. And then you implement it within a certain language. Now, the algorithm is independent of the language, okay? So, this is independent of, this description is independent of the physics. You could have different kinds of qubits, and I'm going to give you more examples of this, but it does not depend upon what physical implementation you're talking about. Whatever kind of qubit you have, it is described by this common native generic language. Right, sir. Now, this is a quantum state. It's the general form of a quantum state. Alpha and beta, both of them are complex numbers. Okay? They are complex numbers. Each one of them is a complex number. Could be real, could be purely imaginary, could be complex, but each part having a real and an imaginary component. Okay? Now, is there a certain constraint on this qubit? Now, this is a qubit. This is the general form of a qubit, of a two-level system. Is there any constraint on these coefficients? Yes. What, what's the constraint? The modulus squared of both the sum of the modulus squared of both Right. So, this is a normalization condition. You must have physically realizable or feasible systems, which means that alpha modulus squared plus beta modulus squared must equal 1. So this is a quantum state with this condition. And remember that alpha and beta, each one of them must be equal to or less, than, must be equal to greater than 0. They can't be negative. Or can they? Yes, they can be negative. So this is no constraint whatsoever. Okay, these the only constraint is that you must satisfy the normalization condition. All right. So what is ket zero? What is ket one? These are the two orthogonal states. What do I mean by orthogonal? Just don't speak up, please. Just. Let me ask, when I point towards you, otherwise it's, it's going to quickly become difficult to handle. What do I mean by orthogonal? Now, orthogonal, the meaning is quite clear. When I talk about normal vectors, right, I'm talking about normal vectors, Now, in normal vectors, what do you mean by orthogonality of vectors? Which vectors are orthogonal to one another? Two vectors that are at 90 degrees with respect to one another in the Euclidean space, in the space that we live in. Any two vectors of this kind, A, and B, are orthogonal if the angle between them is zero which means that the dot product is zero, okay?
or we can say that the overlap between these vectors is 0. Now if I take a vector of this kind, if my a were this vector, then a is not orthogonal to b because I could find a projection of a on b which is the component of a parallel to b and this is non-zero. So this vector a overlaps with vector b. Correct? This is clear. This is high school math. So I use the word overlap here. Two vectors in our normal sense of the word are orthogonal if they don't overlap. Now these two quantum states at 0 and at 1, they also live in some space. They live in a quantum space. <coughs> and they can are orthogonal to one another which means that the overlap of these quantum states is zero try to be in time please the overlap of these quantum states is zero which means that they are non overlapping they are orthogonal to one another now in the language of Dirac we express this notion in the following way I write get zero And then this is a place in a cat. The other label that I'm interested in is one. I place it in a bra. And I put these two together. So I write one in a bra, zero in a cat, and instead of putting two lines in the middle, I just put one line. This object that I've written here, this piece of notation means the overlap of 0 and 1, of quantum state 0 and quantum state 1, right? So this is a quantum analog of this expression, okay? So this is the overlap of 0, cat 0 and cat 1. One of them is written in, in bra notation, right? So this is a notation. And orthogonality means that this is going to be 0. Alright? Likewise, I could, this <coughs> object is the overlap of 0 with 1 or 1 with 0. This is also going to be equal to 0. Now, if I find out the overlap of sket 1 with itself. This should be 1. 1 completely overlaps with itself. Likewise, this is 1. Alright? So this notation in quantum language is called the inner product of two quantum states. So when you promote vectors, to the quantum realm, they are called quantum states and they live in a state space which is called a Hilbert space and the dot product becomes an inner product. The inner product just tells you the degree of overlap between quantum states. Yes? So this is a that much that I've written at the top with an alpha and a beta. I can't. Can you come to the blackboard? I can't see what you. Oh, so this is a cat. This is a cat. This is this is a quantum state, and we know that quantum states are represented. Are they written? And they are embosomed within inside cats, within these symbols. Okay? Now this object here is the dual of a cat. It's an alter ego. It's in some other space that is related to the Hilbert space, but that's beyond the scope of this course. What I would like to mention is that if I would like to find the overlap between two states, I would put one of the states inside a bra and compose it with the corresponding cat. 
Okay. So this is another object. If I write just this or this, this is an object that lives in a dual space, in another space. Okay. But this is not important for the time being. Yes. So a br no, this means <coughs> that this symbol is represents <coughs> the overlap <coughs> of cat one and cat zero. Okay, it represents the overlap of two cats. Yes. No, overlap means the inner product. Just in analogy with this vector example, the overlap means how much of A is parallel to B. But the concept of parallel and perpendicular in the quantum space is different. Now, in this particular case, It just appears to us that the two paths are perpendicular to one another, but that's not always the case. I can have a beam split of this kind. A photon comes in, and this beam splitter divides the path of the photon into two paths like this. And I call one of these paths cat 0 and I call the other path cat 1. Once again, these are orthogonal states. But they don't look <laughs> perpendicular on the diagram. So perpendicularity and parallelism in the quantum world is totally different from the Euclidean world. Okay? That's why I use the word overlap of quantum states. Now, in order to, this is my qubit. This represents my qubit here. Now, when you learn a new language, you should be excited about it. Now, this is a new language whatsoever. It's an altogether new language. It gives you a new way of thinking about nature, about photons, about these subatomic particles. You should be excited about it. And you, you've been complaining about calculus and integration and differentiation, but there's no calculus in here. There's not even algebra. This is basic high school math that enables you to understand how a quantum computer is built and how it works. So now if you look at that qubit over there, alpha at 0 plus beta at 1. This is my state. If I would like to find out the probability that my detector D1 clicks, So now I have this beam sphere once again, but my input is something and I create a general state which is given by this. By the way, I'm going exceptionally slow, slower than what I would have liked because, but never mind, it's better to go steady and slow. So I have this input state and here I create this quantum state, psi. And then I have the detectors D1 and D2.
and I would like to find the probability that detected D1 clicks and this path corresponds to cat 0, this path corresponds to cat 1. Alright? Now the probability that this detected clicks by what we've learned so far is alpha modulus squared. Okay? Now how can I compute that? I could do the following. I could look at my constant state and find its overlap with a certain quantum state. In this case, what is the quantum state with which I need to find an overlap? Get zero. I'm finding out the probability that this detector is going to click. So I find the overlap of this quantum state with get zero. So that overlap is going to be represented in this fashion. And then I take the modulus squared of this. That will give me the probability. Alright, I'm just building upon the concept that I've introduced some moments ago. This probability is, <coughs> now instead of psi, I can write alpha cat 0 plus beta cat 1. Big, a big bracket to represent this side modulus squared which means that I need to find out the inner product of cat 0 with 0 and then there is a plus sign quantum mechanics is linear so I put the plus sign and then I find the overlap of cat 0 with 1 Alpha and beta are only numbers, they are not states, they are only complex numbers, they are scalars in a way. So they come out of the overlap bracket. So I write this as alpha 0 overlap of 0 with itself plus beta overlap of 0 with itself modulus squared. Alright? Why did you? Yeah, yeah, someone died? Yeah, be near someone. Yeah, be near someone. Yeah, yeah, someone. Yeah, be near. Did you understand this? If I have two states, psi and phi. Any two states. I want to find the overlap of these states. What would I do? I would just put one of them in a bra and the other in a cat. This is the symbol for the overlap. This is my definition of an overlap. This is how I am representing overlaps. Alright? So what I need to find out is the overlap is... Please stop this commotion. Excuse me. If I would like to find out the overlap, what I need to do, what state am I talking about? I'm talking about the state psi that exists here, and I would like to find out what is the probability that the detected D1 clicks. So I find the overlap of my state psi with the state corresponding to this path, which is catch 0. So that overlap is psi, this bracket, this inner product, psi with 0. Alright? And then I take the modulus squared. Now the next step, I've just replaced psi with its general form. And then what I've done in the next step is I find the overlap of, I just open up the bracket. I find the overlap of 0 with 0, put alpha with it because this is just a coefficient, it's a scalar, it's a number. And then I find the overlap of 0 with 1. And just put the coefficient in here, that's it. Now what's this number equal to? 1. And what's this number equal to? 0. So my answer is alpha modulus squared. Or if alpha is a complex number, alpha star into alpha. This is how I define a modulus squared. 
Likewise, I can find the probability that this detector is going to click. I'll give you two or three minutes to actually find out the probability that detector D2 clicks. I hope all of you have convinced yourself with a simple calculation that the probability the detected D2 clicks is beta modulus squared. that this detector is going to take. And alpha and beta depend upon the physical device. What kind of superposition the brain spirit creates. Now this is the general form of a qubit. A qubit is described by this state. And this encodes information. And no classical bit can be in a superposition of 0 and 1. You cannot have a capacitor that has charge and it doesn't have charge on it at the same time. You cannot have a current that is going clockwise and anti-clockwise at the same time. You cannot have superposition in the classical world. And the ex mere possibility of existence of superposition is something which is special to the quantum world. Now, a qubit. We have defined a qubit. Let me also give you some background of how a quantum computer is built. In order to understand quantum computing, we need to have a little bit of knowledge of classical computing. 
And the only piece of information that I would like to give you is the concept of logic gates. In just a couple of minutes, I'll just give you an example. Suppose I have a device. And this is the symbol of a device called a NOT gate. Now this device is such that if my input is 0, my output is 1. If my input is 1, my output is 0. This is just a NOT gate. It inverts the input. Now zeros and 1s are classical pieces of information. They can be written on a piece of paper. Excuse me. Now this is an example of a logic gate. And this name, not gate, performs a transformation on the information. It processes the information, right? So it's an information processor. It takes a piece of information which is encoded in zeros and ones and outputs a piece of information also in zero and one. All right? So this is a kind of a logic gate. You can also have Com more complex gates. For example, <coughs> you can have a gate of this kind. Okay, let me represent a NOT gate by just this part. Or I could represent it by NOT. This is more convenient, NOT. Now suppose I build a gate of this kind. Now, remember, there's nothing quantum about this gate. It's still a classical, because we're not dealing with quantum states. Now, this is another classical gate, which is called a controlled NOT gate. Or a C NOT gate. Now, this gate has two inputs. One, the first input, the second input. So two bits come into this gate. Each input is a bit. Bit means zero or one. It's a binary digit, zero or one. This could be zero, this could be one. This could be zero, this could be one. So there are two input channels. Each one of these channels is a bit. Can take up two possibilities. Now, the controlled NOT gate is defined in such a way that the second bit is inverted if the first bit is 1. So the action on the second bit, which is a NOT gate, is determined by the state of the first bit. If the first bit is in a state 1, this bit is inverted. If it's 0, the bit just passes straight through. And nothing happens to the first bit. Alright, so if I were to make a a truth table. I have two inputs and two bits as the output and my inputs can take up four different kinds because I have two bits. There are four possibilities for the two bits. This could be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. First bit, second bit. First bit represented here, the second bit represented here. In the output, nothing happens to the first bit. But the second bit is inverted if the first bit is 1. So, 0, nothing happens to this, nothing happens to this, but this is inverted if the first bit is 1. So, this is the truth table for a controlled NOT gate. Now let's move on to the quantum real now. Okay? And see how so these are building blocks of a classical computer. You build operations out of NOT gates, AND gates, OR gates, NOR gates, NAND gates, etc. Different kinds of gates are composed together in a network or a circuit that takes a bit, piece of information, 
process that information and gives you an output. At least this is how conventional computers work. Now we would like to move on to the quantum reality. In order to do that, when quantum computers were first discovered in the 80s and 90s, this is the model that inspired their thinking. The model came from classical computer science, classical computer organization. And this is the circuit model of quantum computers, which is not used very often these days, but it's easier to understand, so I'm going to stick to this model. Now we would like to create. We've seen that qubits can be made, superpositions can be made to certain devices. Now how do we process that information, that quantum information? <coughs> so we might need to build up analogs, quantum analogs of these gates. Alright, that's the goal. Now, these gates are doing some kind of transformation. They are transforming information or processing information. And it's actually quite convenient to model a qubit or represent a qubit in, in, in a way which is actually very makes life easier. So this is a mathematical representation of a qubit, the most general representation of a qubit. Now what we would like to do, we would like to draw a picture of a qubit. Not a physical picture, but something that represents a qubit. Okay? So we would like to draw a representation of a qubit, and that representation is called the block sphere. Block sphere. Now I'm going to draw a block sphere, which represents a qubit, which is a picture of a qubit, a mental picture of a qubit, not a physical picture, but a mental picture of a qubit. Now in this course, whenever I draw a block sphere, it's going to be in yellow color. So I draw a sphere. The sphere has an equator and a north pole and a south pole. And my quantum state is a vector, is an arrow, whose tail is at the center of this sphere and whose tip, the arrow, lies on some point on the surface of the sphere. The sphere has unit radius. This is called the block sphere. If my arrow it points along the north pole, I call this state. This represents the state ket zero. Okay. If my arrow points on towards the southern hemisphere, I call this state ket1. So two orthogonal quantum states in the block sphere representation are represented not by orthogonal vectors, but they're represented by two arrows, one pointing to the north and one pointing to the south. Okay? Because these quantum states are not normal vectors, they're not Euclidean vectors that need to be orthogonal on a picture. Okay? So this is the block sphere representation of a qubit. This is ket 0, this is ket 1. And they are anti-parallel on the block sphere, which means they are orthogonal. All right? Now if I were to draw a picture of a superposition, say I would like to draw ket 0 plus ket 1 over under root 2. I need this factor or 1 over under 2 for normalization, correct? Now I need to represent this quantum state on the block sphere. Now this is represented by a vector which is on the equatorial plane. So this is 0, this is 1, 0 plus 1 is halfway in between on the x-axis. So this vector 
This quantum state is represented by this vector. Something that points on the x-axis, on the equatorial plane. All right? Okay. Now what I would like to do is, suppose, <coughs> I would like to, now this is not the only poss possible superposition I can create. I can have a minus sign here. I can have minus here, plus here. I can have an arbitrary state. So suppose I would like to create a state which is 0, minus 1 over and over 2. Is this a normalized state? It is again a normalized state. It is another kind of superposition. It's a different kind of superposition because there's a minus sign here. And this relative sign or phase is important. So this is another quantum state that also lies in the block sphere. And if I would like to represent this state on the block sphere, it's going to be represented by an arrow that points on the minus x-axis. On the equatorial plane, but on the minus x-axis. So this is 0 plus 1. 0, 1, 0 plus 1, 0 minus 1. What about this state? Minus, minus, minus 0 plus 1. No. It's going to be 0 plus iota 1. So if I want to draw This is 0 plus iota 1. Alright? Yes, you have a question. Yes. The question that my friend has asked is, this is a quantum state. <coughs> now, what is the quantum state that's orthogonal to this state? I would like to write a state that's orthogonal to this state. Okay? So if I find the overlap of this state with 0 minus 1. Let's try to do that. So I would like to find the overlap between this quantum state and 0 minus 1 under root 2. Could you please find the overlap between these states? Just do it up. Spell it out on your notebooks. So I will put one of this in a bra. How will I do that? I take this state and change the text to bra. 0, minus 1, so the rule is that how do we find the bra corresponding to this cat, I change the cats to bras. And if there is any complex number here, I just write down the complex conjugate of that number. Okay? So there's a real number here, there's minus one here. Minus one remains minus one. Alright? So I take the inner product of this object with this object, 0 plus 1 under root 2. Now I spell it out, this becomes 1 half. Now I can write this as 0 overlap with 0, plus 0 overlap with 1, plus, minus 1 overlap with 0, minus 1 overlap with 1. Correct? I take the overlap of this with this, 
Then I'll tell you the overlap of this with this, overlap of this with this, overlap of this with this. And then what's this overlap? Zero. What's this overlap? What's this equal to? What's this equal to? So 1 minus 1 is 0. <coughs> which means that this state is orthogonal to this state. So this vector will be orthogonal to some other vector pointing on uh, minus y. This state is orthogonal to this state. Both of these quantum states are anti parallel to one another. Now let's take, take a 10 minute break and reconvene in exactly 10 minutes.